Imagine for a moment that you have a job managing a bowling alley. It's one of the many alleys in your town. It's a chain. You have to work long hours to keep the business profitable and growing. You have to make the right decision with unforeseen circumstances such as COVID. You have to keep things interesting and new so your patrons don't get bored and so casual patrons have a reason to come back. And you are a bowling enthusiast. Most days you really like managing a bowling alley. You accepted this job seven years ago and in that time rent has gone up by 40%. Food has gone up by 26%, yet your paycheck has gone down by more than half. Even though you're earning in the top 1% of bowling alley managers, you're still not making minimum wage. What would you do? I would hope that you would quit. The reason I'm using this particular metaphor is because I went bowling the other day at a bowling alley near my house and it was filled with signs apologizing for the staff shortage and offering up to $19 per hour plus benefits to work the front desk. In reality, this bowling alley management position I put you in starts with a salary of around $70,000 plus benefits. In reality. But neither musicians nor venture capitalists live anywhere close to reality. In today's video, we're not going to be talking about Joe Rogan getting $100 million or how streaming services are degrading the way we listen to and explore music. For years, for an exhaustive amount of time now, I've been collecting data from hundreds of independent musicians and small record labels, and I finally feel certain enough to tell you exactly how Spotify is, how do I put this, a grift, a heist. Let's start this with some recent personal numbers that will probably surprise you even if you thought that streaming services were a bad thing. Three years ago, right before the pandemic, I released a full-length album as The Flashbulb. It had a promotional budget, it had a music video, and it was actually pretty well received. At the time of me recording this in January of 2023, this is how much money I made from that album on Spotify since releasing it. Now, a few weeks ago in December, I released a new album exclusively on Bandcamp. There was no promotion, no music video. In fact, I didn't even mention it on social media until about 48 hours before it came out. I priced it at five bucks and the first week it made this much. My point here is that in only seven days, I was able to make more from this half-assed album release than Spotify could pay me in three fucking years. All right, so let's get rid of this new one and compare the exact same album. Our Simulacra made three times more on Bandcamp than it did on Spotify since its release. About two years ago, when I made my last video on this topic, I looked at the data and I noticed that the amount of money streaming services paid artists was sinking by a whole lot. And I wondered to myself if they had pulled a massive bait and switch scheme with royalties. And it wasn't until I got my hands on this, the entire contract agreement between Sony Music and Spotify that I realized that it absolutely was a bait and switch and major labels were completely aware of it. So much so that Sony Music got paid with huge non-refundable advances from Spotify. And in every case I looked into, none of those advances went to the artists. The initial contract with Sony in 2011 paid $25 million to Sony per year, plus $9 million in ad spots, which Sony could then resell. Sony's advances were tied to market share and other variables on an annual basis, so they would keep rising year after year. Spotify knew that if they wanted you to become a Spotify customer and subscriber first, they needed to have the biggest names in music in their library right from the start. And to do this, they threw millions of venture capital dollars at the media conglomerates that own the licenses for the music on an annual basis rather than just promising a fair royalty. So if you're an independent musician and if you ever wondered if Beyonce's label is getting more per stream than you are, the answer is such a complicated form of of course that you're better off just drinking whiskey until you fall asleep laughing maniacally at how unfair the world is. So why would musicians sign up in the first place? Well, I think there are a lot of reasons. To start, most musicians want to adapt to the next big thing and music streaming effectively made access in music so easy that music piracy started dropping, not unlike the effect Netflix had on movie piracy. But musicians couldn't just upload their music to Spotify. Spotify and iTunes couldn't be bothered to actually manage their own library that justifies their existence in the first place. They made independent musicians pay for the privilege for third-party services like TuneCore or DistroKid. A little side note here, Spotify would actually buy a minority stake in DistroKid so they could monetize their own lack of functionality. After a few years, if you wanted to be an 
an independent musician and have your name alongside the bigger artists that Spotify was actually secretly paying up front for, you didn't have any other option. And for someone like myself who came into Spotify having already been making a living as a professional musician, once the payments started coming in, it started making sense. I won't bore you with the details, I already did that in this video, but once Spotify and the other streaming services dominated every other form of music distribution, including radio, take a wild guess what happened. Musicians got f***ed. Here's a way of putting it that tech investors might understand. This is how much Spotify paid independent musicians per stream on average over time. Without a doubt, it is a bait and switch, especially when Spotify's subscriber growth looks like this. Now, when I pointed this out in a video two years ago, I got quite a bit of pushback from investors or day traders who I assume had some sort of stake in Spotify, and I couldn't fathom how they weren't seeing this as a bad thing. It's actively squeezing the life out of the one thing that you're reselling. If Uber Uber drivers were paid so low that they couldn't afford fuel, that would not be good news for investors. I think a lot of people in the music industry have been completely blindsided by this because the modern Silicon Valley business model operates so differently. Most people would describe Spotify's business strategy as something called blitz scaling, and it's both clever and stupid at the same time. The goal is to grow at an absurdly rapid pace and get as high of a market valuation as quickly as possible, and then, after you've succeeded at that, then you find out if the business can be profitable and how to make that work. Seriously. Example, you think of an idea like, what if you could pay $10 a month and see unlimited movies in movie theaters? And movie theaters are like, yeah, that's not really gonna work because the tickets cost more than $10, but you'll figure something out. This will radically transform the film industry and you bullshit your way into raising millions and billions of dollars. So you literally start using your investors' money to give all of your customers debit cards and pay face value for movie tickets. But in order to get more money from investors, you need to tell them that you have more customers so you drop the membership price to $7. Now you're losing somewhere around $40 million a month, but you'll figure something out. Things are getting really stressful, so now would be a good time to sell your company to a super shady foreign investor that nobody has heard of, and then it goes bankrupt and reallocates finances, and then you buy it back and try and raise some more money. Or maybe you live in a city where you have experienced the phenomenon of infinite amounts of money dumping electric f***ing scooters everywhere. Does that seem like a profitable business venture to you? Most investors know that it's not, but they don't care. It's just a matter of buying low and selling high. When a business is founded on blitz scaling or fast scaling, if growth slows down before a profitable business model is discovered, everything goes kaput. It's all or nothing. So the top priority above all other things is to keep growing. And in cases such as Movie Pass or Uber, the customer gets a slight lifestyle upgrade paid for by a pool of venture capital investments. Now in Spotify's case, the venture capital capital allowed the initial membership fees to be low and the royalties to be relatively high. That way more artists would get on board and keep their music there. But since Spotify wouldn't dare risk slower growth of subscribers, their immense losses are bandaged and subsidized from independent musicians, both by cutting their royalties and charging them for listing prioritization on things like the marquee program. Unfortunately, due to Spotify's market share and absolute dominance and presence on everybody's phones, as a result, the percentage perceived value of music in general has dropped to unsustainable levels. And an extremely optimistic take would be saying that the music economy is at critical mass and not utterly irreparable. One might ask, is Spotify's business model functional without a profit? And the answer to that depends on who you ask and what you mean by functional. Do you remember earlier in this video when I told you about the major labels having backdoor agreements with Spotify? Well, a lot of that was huge amounts of stocks in Spotify being transferred to the record labels, and almost all the labels dumped that stock right after it went public. The CEO is worth $5 billion. Employees like Don Ostroff get about $7.5 million in salary. Third-party companies like DistroKid that exist solely to charge you to put your music on Spotify have a billion-dollar valuation, and Spotify Spotify's investors have made, well, about that. Now, I'm no big city economist, but it seems to me that a blitz scaling strategy would work best with rock bottom interest rates. And if you haven't noticed, that parade came to a screeching halt. When those rates were low, Spotify for a long time has had a lot of trouble finding a profit, but it's about to get a whole lot worse. And this isn't news to most investors. But the much bigger issue with the streaming platform business model that investors seem to be wildly ignoring is that 
none of these platforms own any of the assets that they're reselling. They don't even have a license for them for the next fiscal year. Let's say that there was some sort of, I don't know, a viral Reddit post that created some sort of pseudo online musician union, or let's just say that Joe Rogan said something else completely insane that was the straw that broke the camel's back. If there was just some sort of small movement or occurrence where a few thousand independent artists with fan bases similar to mine decided to remove their music from Spotify today, it very well could create a snowball effect with subscribers. And of course, as a customer, if you put your AirPods in and picked up your phone expecting to hear some artists that you're accustomed to listen to and all of a sudden weren't able to find them, you're not going to recite your loyalty to Spotify, you'll just use a platform that has the artists you listen to. The point is, this platform is extremely fragile and it is increasingly neglecting the only asset that it has. If you're an investor who has a stake in Spotify or music streaming platform and you think that there's a chance that they will stabilize and eventually make a profit or a steady long-term profit, I can tell you after spending years excruciatingly analyzing both the artist and business side of this microeconomy, I am as certain as I could possibly be that you are wrong. At least a few people watching this are thinking, well, Ben, why don't you just take your music off of Spotify then? Because I get those comments every single time I mention any of these problems. But I also get plenty of messages asking me to put more of my albums, especially my older albums on Spotify. And in this last week, I've had plenty of people complaining that my newest album isn't there. It's a double-edged sword. I want to stop being part of the system, but I also don't want to take it out on my listeners, most of whom believe that they're adequately supporting artists by listening to them on a streaming service. For me at least, I don't think that folding my arms and saying anyone that subscribes to Spotify is part of the problem is helpful. I think that making videos like this and being a broken record every time somebody asks me about these things is helpful. But the truth is, is that if everybody stopped using streaming services right now, they'd have what? Bandcamp, iTunes, piracy. None of these are adequate replacements. So what do we do? If you're an Apple Music customer, or if you thought that switching to Apple Music was a solution, Nope, they've been doing the exact same thing. Independent artists are making an average of 32% less per stream than when most of them put their music on the platform. In fact, Apple Music launched with a pseudo internal blitz scaling method. They tried to bring in a bunch of subscribers with a three month free trial with no intention of paying artists during that period. They were subsidizing growth through royalties because they otherwise would have had to spend their own money. Title though, right? It was built by artists to be fair to artists. Wrong. For me, personally, Tidal, when they've actually paid out, is now paying 51% less per stream than when I signed on. All right, let's get to the center here. This is important. The streaming business model simply does not work. Any future platform of this type will need a similar strategy in order to gain a sizable market share that could promise to reach profit in the long term. And beyond that, even with iTunes or Amazon Music or Bandcamp, these are for-profit companies. It is their legal duty to their investors to eventually pay as little as they can possibly get away with while charging as much as they can. It's still completely botched. Capitalism only works when there's scarcity. We have concocted insane unconstitutional laws that make you a criminal for humming a song in public or transferring a file to try and force it to work without scarcity. Capitalism above all things requires growth and the function of intellectual property is the opposite to growth. It's about monetizing intangible things and then trying to profit by limiting who has access to them. The only way that this makes money is when you sidestep it by selling convenience, novelty, or if you're simply making people too scared of punishment from their government to share information with one another. The sooner that artists, intellectual property holders, and investors can accept and digest this, then the sooner we can build a music industry that doesn't collapse every single decade. If you're a musician or any type of artist that tries to make a living off of their work, this all probably sounds like really bad news, but it's not. A post-scarcity society is considered utopian. In 1999, something really important happened. A group of college students made an incredibly easy way to share music files that didn't require a web host. I think everybody in the tech and business world saw the potential that an MP3 file has and then companies like Apple regurgitated it into crap like iTunes. But in this colossal change of the music industry, they conveniently glossed over the most important part, decentralization. It turns out that we don't need 
Apple or Sony Music or Spotify to listen to music, and it exposed the reality of intellectual property that I had just mentioned. It turns out that we also don't need Twitter Incorporated or Meta or Facebook or Elon Musk or Mark Zuckerberg or even YouTube. All of these things can be done without a private data center, CEOs, or even copyright. And as long as we have a free market, it eventually will be. And surprisingly, recently, nonprofits are actually accelerating this. Things like Signal and Mastodon are great examples of nonprofit projects that function far more efficiently than what they're trying to replace because there isn't a profitable business to manage. And no, the mention of decentralization here has nothing to do with cryptocurrencies or NFTs, nor should it. The whole idea here is to build an economy that supports individuals that create things that you enjoy, not concoct more ways to profit off of artificial scarcity. So what should we do in the meantime? I think that if you are a subscriber to a streaming service, now might be a good time to cancel that subscription and enjoy the novelty of finding a music file player that you enjoy and doing some exploring to find some new music that you like without an algorithm supplying it for you. By the way, I don't think Bandcamp will solve these problems. I don't think Epic Games bought them because they love music so much. I think they'll eventually find a way to squeeze as much profit as possible out of it. But in the meantime, it does pay rather fairly and it's a great place to find new music on your own. I've always used it in my browser, but the app allegedly supports direct streaming now. As for musicians, encourage your fans to support you elsewhere. Let them know that that helps you create more material that they enjoy. You could drive the point in a bit more by not releasing music on streaming services at all, or you could make a gentler point by releasing music on streaming services a few months or weeks after you release them on Bandcamp or your own platform. Just this last week, I tried uploading a slightly limited version of my newest album to Spotify, and surprisingly, it got someone's attention and wasn't very well received. I can't really speak publicly about that conflict at the moment, but to me, it's good news to not be completely ignored even if the only attention daddy is giving me is when I misbehave. More, if not most importantly, we're musicians because we love making music. It's as simple as that. There's nothing further from the purity and beauty of making music than the dumpster fire of a tech company blitzscaling. When the music streaming model collapses, and it will, we'll still have this gift. And hey, speaking of supporting artists, I have a Patreon and it's connected to a Discord community. We do monthly songwriting challenges, we play games, we talk about things like decentralized music streaming. For the last year, they've been hearing me complain about the struggles of starting a 501c3 to do this very thing. But also there's loads of audio assets and over 34 hours of unreleased music. It's awesome and you can join us for as little as $1. I'm out, keep creating, bye.